in a sense, I know he was going to bring his site manager and they were going to talk with Guy about the holes that they're punching through all the walls for this. But I mean, we're actually going to install it from back to front, you know, so this, these will actually be the last installs that we do right at this level. Oh, really? Level. Wow. Because, I mean, originally I thought we'd come to the North Garden and we'd do it just like a book, you know, it's where it's from the start, primordial emergence flight and then desire tree of life contemplation. But we'll start with contemplation. I think it started in 2009 and it's 2014 now. It was like the museum was built for that installation. It's just one of those things that just doesn't ever happen, and it, and it happened. I mean, it's way bigger than anything he or anybody else has ever done. It's the largest figural glass installation that I'm aware of. It is an artist's dream to get to work on that scale. I mean, it's a 105-foot running wall, and it was blank to make things this large out of glass and this fragile. It's not logical, but I think that's what makes for great art in the end. Museum opened on March 25, 1990. We had a permanent collection, but not a very significant permanent collection. In the 1980s, when the Knoxville Museum of Art was being funded and uh, was being conceived, Many museums were, in some respect, trying to be mini metropolitans. And in many ways, that was unfortunate. With its permanent collection, higher ground, Knoxville Museum of Art has been focusing on regional art. And I think it's very important that we do this in all areas of life because we want to put a spotlight on everything that we do regionally, whether it's food or art or music. You want the museum that you have in your own community to be the cultural repository, not only of the canon of art, but also for them to see that you can be from a place like Knoxville and have aspirations and actually achieve them. David Butler, when he came to the museum as our executive director, he changed a lot of things. He looked to where he could make things better. And those of us who don't work with glass or with metal can barely grasp the complexity of conceiving, creating, and fabricating something this large. To me, it's something that has cried out for some kind of large-scale installation of, of some kind. I was standing with Richard um, on the balcony, and I said, I'd love to see something in here. I had no idea that it would ever happen. Tommy and Richard came over one night to have a drink with us, and we started talking about the vision, and then we pretty much offered to do it. The only criteria they gave is that when it's all finished and installed, they wanted to be able to say, wow. It's a tremendous amount of trust and a tremendous amount of belief in, in what Richard is doing. And that's a real gift. I had no idea she was going to say, <laughs> we'll do this. I mean, this was out of the blue. The next morning, I said, you realize this is an open-ended thing. We have no clue where this is going. We're extremely fortunate to have Ann and Steve want to do this. So really what I'll, I'll do is sort of start to work on, on figures and, and just sort of uh, block out what uh, specific shapes are. With this, it truly is just a, a fact of size and scale. I think as you start to work on these, I'm, I'm really not completely worried about the specific finished image. I really am trying to develop sort of a gestural quality of what the scale will be. Richard wants this to be universal. He wants it to be big. He wants it to be ambitious. When I started on the project, I wanted to have a sense of place. And then a sense of a male and female figure. And as I started to evolve at that point, I realized I was talking about a life cycle. He's calling it cycle of life, but the implication is that the, the cycle starts with, with creation and, and then you go through the different stages that are represented there. And 
and it all kind of dissolves in the end into a cosmos. To me, the cycle of life, is a, that's a big, scary concept. Richard always says, you got to take risk. If you don't take risk, how are you going to get from the starting point to the finishing point? That's how really great things happen, is not being afraid to jump off a ledge. We collectively have big ambitions for this project to really change the conversation in Knoxville and about Knoxville. I so believe that cycle of life can be and is the tipping point of bringing art to the forefront in Knoxville. It is Knoxville's Sistine Chapel. I think it's fair to say that in 30 years ago, if someone at Art News Magazine was thinking about East Tennessee, they would just kind of look at you like, what, what are you talking about? What, what could possibly come from there that would be the least bit interesting, except a moonshine jug? Of course, there are people that still are very provincial. And I'm not talking about people in Knoxville. I'm talking about people in bigger cities. If you think the only place that anything is happening is in a major urban area, you're vastly mistaken because most cultural trends start from the bottom and go up. Glass probably is one of the most beautiful, seductive, attractive mediums. Glass is a material that's not really understood yet. It's still a relatively young material for art. And you had little figurines and things in the 1920s and 30s, tabletop sculptures. But as a real material for sculpture, that did not begin to happen until the 1970s. It took some freewheeling people in the 60s and 70s saying, you know, what, you can do anything with this. What if you take it onto a much different scale and you use colors in different ways and you bend it, you, you shape it, you begin to explore, uh, as anyone does, uh, sculpturally. At one point, it's a very, very fluid, free-moving, and I think a lot of us in the beginning tried to capture that. We were all getting together to get as much knowledge about that material as we could do. People were watching, they were aware of one another, and they were often breaking rules. They were told what they couldn't do, therefore they did it. And Richard is a good example of that. He has such facility with that difficult medium. It's hard and it's hot and it's dangerous, and it's really wonderful to watch him work and manipulate that that gooey mess and make something out of it and to control it and to make it do what he wants it to do. He has a loose, wonderful rhythm to how he works with glass, and I see that in every piece he does. From the very beginning, really, he kind of took his own path. He works very sculpturally with glass, which is different. Um, He's not your typical glass blower. He does a variety of sculptural work, but I'm thinking primarily of his, what they call amasiccio sculpting. It's an Italian technique. It means sculpting in the mass. He is the best American sculptor to practice these techniques. He taught himself how to manipulate this really difficult and kind of dangerous medium to make very expressive human figures that, that carry all kinds of implied narratives and meanings and, and emotions. I think Richard has gained a lot of freedom and privacy as an artist um, by living in the Knoxville area. Richard has been free from the uh, aesthetic of, of the West, so to speak. 
He knows Southern storytelling traditions, and he works those stories into his early glass pieces. Not a lot of people were doing that in glass. 30 years ago, what he was doing was very much out of step with the mainstream, but he knew what he wanted to do, and he did it. I think with this being this way and we need to go larger, yeah. I think we'll just need to work the outside as I start to yeah, ink right. it in. Yeah. I mean, we could get this part all in one part too easily. Yeah. To me, it is very linear. It looks like a total progression from point A to point B of what his work is and what he's always been dealing with, which is the human condition. The head shoots if the head's big, big enough. So when we first started uh, working on the project, we went to Pompeii and uh, Naples and some other areas to look at the frescoes, because I think one of the things that I wanted to do was to view art in the scale that I would be making for this installation. Richard appreciates, understands, respects tradition, and he's looking to the future as well. As an artist, you have to have a fierce belief in yourself. So if you want to improve, you have to be extremely critical. And I think for criticism to be accepted and appreciated, it also has to come from someone you respect. I met Tommy in the late 70s through uh, mutual friends. There must have been something appealing. We're still together. <laughs> I can't imagine Richard without Tommy. I don't think you can say where one ends and the other begins. As introverted as I am, she's probably the extroverted type. But she's very vivacious. She's very uh, intelligent. She's very articulate. It's amazing to me what a team they are and have become over the years. And a piece like this reflects, I think, a lot of that sophisticated teamwork. If we look down at it, I think this should be free floating. Really, the first year was all research and development and figuring out how, how can I do this. But Richard, I don't think, ever sees any limitations on anything. He had uh, ideas about doing these large figures in his head, and he just didn't know how to make them of that scale. It is somewhat of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I think the thing that I get is every step along I get, I realize how large it is. I actually made this piece as a route for being able to talk with a structural engineer about how much weight load I would have in, in uh, a given run, four running foot structure. And although this is great, it has a minimal feel to it. I wanted to have much more of a humanistic touch of the handle, It'd be a little bit more expressionistic. Richard is so humble that you would never imagine what all he had to go through in terms of designing and engineering of this piece of work. So there is a huge engineering element to it. So once Richard's done with his drawing, his ink drawing, and he's got it the way he wants it, we bring it up here and we start the process of making our jigs so that we can make our molds to pour our glass into. So for this particular one, I made a jig uh, that basically covers this part of the face. This jig made this part of this mold here. So we get all that welded together and then pour our glass into the mold down in the hot shop. It's very much of an old school, very much pattern making. We traced out the drawing where we use those as templates to plasma cut sections of metal, which became our front armature or our drawing for the piece. Very successful with what I consider the quantum jump from this imagery to this imagery for the uh, final commission. The project going on at the museum right now is a feat of engineering as well as art. So we'll pivot it once we get uh, in the space. He's used to laying things out, and this is the same thing on, on an even bigger and, and more complicated scale. So what we're trying to do is mock up sort of a first scale uh, space proportion for uh, this corner of the installation. And even though these um, look inconsequential, they actually are a very good learning tool supporting these big, heavy metal and glass objects. That's probably the trickiest thing to work out. And to take that into consideration, but also have a design that's pleasing and kind of floats up there on the wall. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very, it's a big set of challenges. 
It's sort of odd that you have this sort of very weighty material and, and what is something very architecturally permanent, and yet you want to have it have this sort of sense of life, this sense of ephemeralness. If you work in glass as your main medium, that's not a, a medium that lends itself to improvisation. You have to design the project, hit the aesthetic marks, make sure that there's a way to actually make those things that you envision and make them stay up there. When his assistants are working with him, Richard has found ways to not only work collaborative, but to create a, almost a dance in his studio. like each a reheat and then we'll set it up to break it off. Good. The real excitement is when the, the fire's on, the furnaces are on, and we're all working as a team being choreographed by Richard all this time. Gravity is always working against you. If you stop turning while you're working with hot glass, it just droops off onto the floor. Sometimes you can be on the stick, quote unquote, for up to four or five hours, depending on what you're making. And so there's a level of stamina that's involved, uh, as well as a, a mental toughness that you need to keep up with the piece and not let it get too brittle and cold. It doesn't even seem like he's keeping track of time, but I can tell you in his mind, it's like a metronome. Good. And he knows exactly how many minutes or you know seconds he's got to do something and then needs to get it back into the furnace. I think that it takes a commitment on everyone's part to see something to fruition. When you've been with a project for so long, it becomes like the back of your hand, you just know it. And so that initial excitement when, when you start a project, all that energy, it kind of gets diffused over the years as, as you go by and you, become, you go from being very excited about a project to mastering the mundane of the project. If you're gonna be an artist, it's like breathing. You breathe in, you breathe out, you work on the project, you continue. Uh, yeah. To hold our glass components to the museum wall, we have developed a, a, a steel armature system. And so this is our master template where all these components are steel. We'll start to put these on the wall and then we'll start to insert our 130, 150 odd glass components. So we've actually got it coded out for each of the branches and then the birds, so, so everything's numbered. So hopefully when we assemble them, we'll you know, be able to go, oh, we need you know, 78, let's put it in. And so this is our first test. We've, we've assembled it previously on the ground. Now we're gonna do a vertical test and make sure that everything's adjusted just properly. And then I'll need bird 25. Oh. I, I do think the general perception, if you talk to most people, is that artists, you know, probably are scattered or, you know, not focused. And, and most artists that I know that have achieved a certain amount of success are incredibly organized. Well, with all the project, what we're doing is we're doing a final stage mock-up. And so we're loading it up on the truck, going over to the annex, and we're doing our final stagings. Good, sharp so this is actually the first time we've moved any of the larger That's scale uh, pieces over. You guys tensing it. So this will be sort of like a, our first little test run of it driving down the highway. Who's got our new straps that we just bought? Do we have our other side done? Not Do we not have a tarp? I deal with it. Do we not have a tarp? And we need to get this other stuff in. And we lay this across the top. Slide across the top, lay it across the top. Are we too wide? 
They were calling for thunderstorms. I thought we were going to beat it, and I guess we missed it. The logistics of this whole process are monumental. No matter how big your vision was, you're going to encounter issues that you hadn't planned on. How do you solve that? We're about six inches too tall to make it in under the bridge, so we're going to have to back up and go around. I think he knew it would be hard, and uh, it's, it's a really ambitious project. He's doing things that nobody's ever done before, and there was no, there's no template or no guidebook. Sorry. Got two foot. Watch your hand. Good thing it's wet today. <laughs> you realize with this cradle now, it would be best to have laid her flat. Then we wouldn't have any trouble going through all the bridges and those sort of things. She's a little bit wide, but I, I, that would have been less of a problem. No, I mean, let's, let's face it, it's enough to make you grumpy, but uh, it seemed like it worked out. I think that's part of his DNA, is anything's possible. Whereas I would probably sit back and go, oh, God, this is going to be so hard. <laughs> like, let's think of something else to do. Maybe they'd like a chandelier. <laughs> I sort of have it broken down in two walls. One is the uh, south wall, which is sort of adolescence, which is primordial emergence, flight and then uh, maturity, which is desire, tree of life, which is the section with the doves and the branches, and contemplation. The 105-foot wall of the museum is bisected by a 20-foot gap, therefore, i.e., there's a stutter in your articulation of your narrative. So sky became the element that tried to bridge the structural gap of the uh, mezzanine stairwell. All these sections with the tubes will have a mirrored glass orb in them, actually one on each end. I wanted the universe uh, section of sky to be these mirrored orbs because I wanted this sort of reflective glow and a sense of, you know, wonderment that we have looking at a night sky and a sense of place in the universe. I think it'll be exciting to see it up and in place because it will actually be the first time that it can actually be viewed in total together. Richard's installation raises the bar for us, and we have to sort of bring up the rest of our operation to that level. The building's a generation old now. It had had some issues with water intrusion over the years, some other kind of deferred maintenance, and this uh, gave us a deadline that we had to get some things done by. It's got a slight twist to it, but when we push it in, it'll, it'll be it. Don't you think if we get both ladders dead under it, we can just kind of just go? Yeah. We see these steel uh, tubes coming out of the wall. Uh, that is our support structure for all our uh, larger weight-bearing uh, images or icons on the wall. The posts are designed to be load-bearing for a specific weight. In the section that we're talking about here, the male figure is approximately 1,600 pounds. The female fixture is approximately 1,400 pounds. Putting the whole project in feels somewhat precarious. I think it's unprecedented for an artist working in glass to make things of this scale. As much as it weighs, it can be broken. That's a huge glass piece in terms of the weight, but at the same time, it is still somewhat fragile. Side shifted. You need to come this way. You're good. Whoa, whoa, whoa. All right, yeah, we need to. Um... We need, to, we need to let it down, Richard, and have a little talk. What's, what's the issue here? It's either the wrong piece or we're missing a tube. I, th I think we may just have the wrong plinth. Let's take a look. Yeah, are you 36 and a quarter, something like that? You're the, are 37? Yes. Yeah, we're missing a post. We're putting seven tons on that wall. The last thing we want is for something we've worked on for four years to come crashing down. 
Yeah. What's in the wall matches the drawing. Drawing. But the drawing, the drawing doesn't, doesn't match, match the, the reality. I got you. Okay. Yeah. Now we're trying to get resolved working with the structural engineers and the riggers to see what's going on. There's no load right there. <clears throat> right. I mean, Those two posts are the load, most load bearing for the female. Right. I think we'd be OK to put it up. All right, so we're going to resume, I guess. We were very lucky in talking with a structural engineer. We feel that that's a non-load bearing uh, rod. So uh, it's as good as it gets for having a mistake. <laughs> Richard doesn't talk about his challenges, the immensity of the project. I mean, it's made me realize that he has got a determination and a work ethic that's hidden behind his preserved demeanor. Richard is not only very scientifically based, he's very logical, he's very methodical, and he seems to have a great ability to see and perceive the components involved in something, the players involved, to work with those players, which is a real skill in and of itself. I'm finally beginning to realize how large it really is. It's hard to say how a big project like this would affect an artist. I like the fact that Richard does what he does in a very low key way. And he does it quietly, steadily, and I think on a level that sneaks up on you sometimes. I think this project is gonna sneak up on people. Well, one reason I came to Knoxville was that it felt like, and I couldn't prove it, but you just get these, you get these uh, feelings about a place. There is just the sense that things were really about to happen. Knoxville may be in the emergence part of things, which is the beginning, which is the exciting part, um, where everything's ahead of you and, you know, the possibilities are, are there. I'm like, see if I hope we're in flight. flight. Yeah. I hope our city continues to grow. I like the uh, tree of life and that, that, that blossoming. Things just, just bursting out all over flowers and birds and leaves. And I think that's kind of where we are right now. I think we're at a, it's a, it's a good, it's a good moment. Won't stay there forever, but um, that's part of the whole, the whole cycle. Knoxville is a contemplation and the sky's the limit. Richard made a statement to me once that took me a few years to get. He said, you know, really, on the opposite ends, there, there seems to be conflict. And then when you get to the middle, you realize how similar everything really is. There's not really any difference between humans. We're all very similar people and have very similar desires, no matter where we're from or where we live. There's a commonality to all of us. And, and I think that's something not to be dismissed but to be celebrated. You always want to feel like what you're talking about has a universal voice on some level. And I feel very lucky that I've had the opportunity to work on this uh, ambitious project. I feel lucky that it happened to be me, but it would be a fabulous project if it was being done in New York or Washington, D.C. or Los Angeles or Knoxville. And it just happens to be Knoxville. <laughs>